Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Cruz. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a member of the Music and Worship Committee here at First Parish Plymouth Unitarian Universalist. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's service on October 25th, when our theme is the Four Freedoms. The service is being recorded uh, thank you to Linda Harding, who is our technical director today. Uh, the first half of the service is recorded. The recording stops before our joys and concerns and the pastoral prayer. Um, and you are all invited to remain online after the announcements for small group conversation. Uh, we are not able to meet together, but we found a joy in meeting on Zoom. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever you believe, wherever you are on your spiritual journey today, you are so welcome here. Come and walk with us this hour. Our morning service will now begin with a call to worship by Paul Robeson. I shall take my voice wherever there are those who want to hear the melody of freedom or the words that might inspire hope and courage in the face of despair and fear. My weapons are peaceful for it is only by peace that peace can be attained. The song of freedom must prevail. And now please join in as we sing with Sandy, one of my favorite hymns from the hymnal number 159. This is my song to the tune of Finlandia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Art Lavoie, minister at First Parish in Plymouth, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. 
And please join me in the words of our chalice lighting that are on your screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in freedom, to speak the truth in love and to help one another. Today's story is adapted from Pedro Pablo Sacrician's story called The Tiger. Once upon a time, there was a colorless tiger. All of his shades were gray, black, and white. So much so that he seemed like something out of a black and white movie. His lack of color had made him so famous that the world's greatest painters had come to his zoo to try and paint some color onto him. None of them succeeded, as the colors would always drip down off of his skin onto the ground. Then along came Van Gogh, a crazy painter. He was a strange guy and he traveled everywhere, happily painting with his brush. Well, it would be more accurate to say that he moved his brush about as if to paint because he never actually put any paint onto his brush. Neither did he use a canvas or paper. He painted the air and that's why they called him Van Gogh. So when he said he wanted to paint the colorless tiger, everybody had a good laugh, but he was fixed on it. When entering the tiger's cage, he began whispering to the animals in his ear and moving his dry brush up and down the tiger's body. He whispered and painted and whispered and painted. The more he whispered and painted, the larger the crowd became to everyone's surprise, the tiger's skin started to take on colors. They were the most vivid colors any tiger had ever had. Van Gogh spent a long time whispering to the animal and stroking with his brush and making slight adjustments to his painting, a little here, a little there. The result was truly beautiful. When he was finished, Van Gogh said goodbye to the tiger and left the cage. Everyone wanted to know what the painter's secret was. He explained to them that his brush was only good for painting real life and that to do that, he needed no colors. He had managed to paint the tiger using a phrase he kept whispering into its ear. In a few days, you will be free. You shall see. Seeing how sad the tiger had been in his captivity and how joyful the tiger had seemed at the prospect of freedom, the zoo authorities knew what they must do. The next day, they opened the tiger's cage and they loaded him onto a truck. They transported the tiger to the forest where they had found him and they set him free where never again would he lose his colors. Many stories end with someone saying, the moral to the story is, and then they state what the lesson is. I wonder what the moral to this story is. Is it when we are free to be who we are, all our colors come out? Is it sometimes we need help from others to gain our freedom? I wonder what you decide the moral will be to this story. I, I thank you, Deb, for that beautiful story. Our reading today 
is from an address to Congress by Franklin Delano Roosevelt on January 6, 1941. In the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings, which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against its neighbor everywhere in the world. That is no vision of a distant millennium. It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. That kind of world is the very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny, which the dictators seek to create with the crash of a bomb. A good society is able to face schemes of world domination and foreign revolutions alike without fear. Since the beginning of our American history, we have been engaged in change, in a perpetual peaceful revolution a revolution which goes on steadily, quietly adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camp or the quicklime in the ditch. The world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly, civilized society. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights or to keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose. To that high concept, there can be no end save victory. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, to the Redwood Forest, to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. As I went walking, that ribbon of highway, I saw from me. sun came shining and I was strolling and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling and the fog was lifting all voice was chanting this land was made for you and me this land is your land this land is my land
There may be a few of you in this congregation who still remember that State of the Union address that President Roosevelt gave nearly 80 years ago on January 6th, 1941. And there are a few more of us who might remember or have seen the Norman Rockwell images that were inspired by that speech, which were shown on your screens while Karen did the reading. Let's try to remember what things were like at that moment in time. Europe was at war. Germany had invaded Poland a couple of years before France had fallen. England was under the siege of the strategic bombing raids that were known as the Blitz. Here in the United States, we were still struggling with the after effects of the Great Depression. And there was much talk of whether or not we would enter this war. It seemed increasingly to come down to the question of when rather than whether. That was the setting and the mood of the country as Roosevelt gave a speech that included the section Karen read on the four freedoms. The ideals of freedom harken back to the Declaration of Independence and the values that inspired us to fight the tyranny of the British crown. The Reverend Forrest Church in his book, The American Creed, identifies both of these documents, the Declaration of Independence and Roosevelt's Four Freedom Speech among, among those significant and decisive documents that have laid the foundation for what this country stands for. In their crucible, he writes, were transfigured the elements that would reflect America's promise and set the measure of its fulfillment. You know, we all have these things we carry around in our heads, memories, ideas, phrases, moral principles, statements that define us, things we believe about ourselves, truths we hold to be self-evident, don't we? They form the basis of our personal creed, even though we may not always live up to what we hold as our highest ideals. The same thing happens collectively. As families, as communities, and nations, we have common stories and statements that define us, however accurate or not. They give us and others an image of who we are or who we think we are. These ideas are tested in the crucible of our daily lives, and it's important to return to them time and again to see if we are living up to the ideals that we have set for ourselves. Or have those ideas, ideas and ideals become hollow, false, or misleading? We are in the midst of another grueling presidential election where chaos, lies, and mean-spiritedness reign supreme as we continue to struggle with the virulent coronavirus and the polarization and confusing information rec uh, and rhetoric that have been given regarding that virus. Every four years, we enter what should be a vigorous debate about our democratic principles and leadership we need to bring them to fruition. And every four years, I cringe and feel embarrassed about the tone and the content of these debates. When I think things can't get any worse, they do. When Forrest Church writes of the defining ideals and documents that illuminate our national story, he often uses the phrase, America's creed 
and America's promise. For what we believe about ourselves offers us and others a promise of who we can become. But this larger vision is held up to us over and over again by people who have in practice been excluded from it, women and people of color especially. Individuals also come along who hold up a mirror to show us images that we would rather not see, reminding us once again of those things that are most important and most sacred in our historical narrative. They offer us a vision of who we might become and how we might better practice what is articulated in our historical narrative. The Black Lives Matter movement has recently just done that, held up a mirror for us to see the things that we don't want to see. Most of the four freedom speech prior to the section that was read talks about the war that was currently raging in Europe. Roosevelt begins the speech saying that this country has never been under as much of a threat from without as it was at that moment. And that we will not isolate ourselves or bow down to the powers of tyranny that would wish to subvert democracy everywhere. Great words for us to remember today. In the speech, he also talks at length about the increase in manufacturing of armaments of war, not only for our protection, but also to make available to our allies. And you know, he could have stopped there. He could have made the whole speech about the war effort, how everyone was pulling together and how great America was for withstanding tyranny. For some, that might have been enough. What is brilliant and inspiring about the speech was what happened next. About three quarters of the way through, reflecting back on our creedal narrative, he changes the tone of the speech and lists several things that are foundational to what he calls a healthy and strong democracy. And those are equal of opportunity for youth and for others, jobs for those who can work, security for those who need it, the ending of special privileges for a few, the preservation of civil liberties for all, and the enjoyment of the fruits of scientific progress in a wider and constantly rising standard of living for everyone. He continues. These are the simple, the basic things that must never be lost sight of in the turmoil and unbelievable complexity of our modern world. The inner and abiding strength of our economic and political systems is dependent upon the degree to which they fulfill these expectations. But in fact, especially today, I suggest that we often lose sight of these things that make us a healthy and strong democracy. Once again, we need to be reminded and we need to expect our local and national elected officials to stand by these principles. Roosevelt then turned his vision globally and reflects on the four freedoms freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. He returns to a vision of American democracy reflective of our founding documents, and he expands that vision to everywhere in the world. Now, there's a story that's told about Roosevelt presenting this idea to some of his trusted advisors, and one of them, Harry Hopkins, said that he was concerned about the phrase everywhere in the world. You know, that covers a lot of territory, Mr. President. He said, I don't know how interested Americans are going to be in the people of Java. 
I'm afraid they'll have to be someday, Harry, Roosevelt responded. The world is getting so small that even the people in Java are getting to be our neighbors now. It's remarkable. Nearly 80 years ago, when he led the nation, President Franklin Roosevelt had a vision of the kind of global community that we often speak of today. He had a glimpse of the kind of interconnectedness that was needed to preserve life and liberty everywhere in the world. And the role of the United States in his vision of the global community was one of ensuring basic rights and freedoms for all human beings. This inspires me, and I hope it does you as well. Now, you know, I don't mean to idealize Roosevelt this morning and disregard his shortcomings. For we know that just one short year after this speech on February 19th, 1942, Roosevelt established internment camps for American citizens of Japanese descent. These internment camps were not as horrific as those set up by either German, but the Germans or the Japanese, though they did destroy lives and cost many people their land and their livelihood. We don't always live up to our creed and our promise. And we face a similar moral crisis today. Is the lack of cooperation, the racism, sexism, greed, and bullying that we see on a national scale consistent with our ideas of who we think we are? Do we still believe that we have a role or at least an example to set in ensuring the rights and freedoms of individual people everywhere in the world? I fear that we've once again lost our collective moral vision, both abroad and here at home. I fear that we have become consumed by a golden idol that calls us to be self-centered with fear and greed. I'm afraid that we forget that personal freedom always includes responsibility to the rights and freedoms of others. I'm concerned that we confuse our greatness for we have truly been a great nation, that we confuse our greatness with an arrogance that bullies our own citizens and the rest of the world as well. I'm concerned that we've become obsessed with our own safety and security. We have forgotten that life well lived always includes some risk and that we can never truly know what surprises and challenges we might face. The gap between rich and poor grows wider. And once again, like it's so many times in our history, we are asked to fear new immigrant groups entering our country rather than to embrace the richness of the diversity that they bring us. What happens to our vision of freedom? What has happened? to our vision of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. What has happened to that moral compass, the crucible of our transformation? What has happened to freedom of speech and expression, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear? That is no vision of a distant millennium, Roosevelt wrote. 
It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own lifetime and generation. And as he said at the end of the speech, this nation has placed its destiny in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Once again, as Roosevelt says, it is in our hands and is as it has always been to call ourselves, each other, and our nation to live up to its promise, its highest ideals. Once again, it is time for us to step forward and ask that these be more than sweet sounding words that make us feel better about ourselves. It is our task, it is our call, especially as people of faith, to remain mindful of the responsibilities that accompany freedom and prosperity and demand that our elected leaders do so as well. In April of 1945, in a speech Franklin Roosevelt was preparing a week before his death, he wrote, today, we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples of all kinds to live together and work together in the same world at peace. Let us always strive to make it so. Amen, and blessed be. Please join in singing our closing hymn, Sound Over All Waters. <laughs> 